welcome friends on this second day of our two day event in stockholm sweden I'm very happy to see you again this morning i was reading an article by a scientist the title was can we now introduce artificial free will into our computers interesting to find an article on free will it follows from the artificial intelligence they have been able to put into computer chips and then put those computer chips into robots this person discusses free will from the point of view of physics he's a professor of physics free will has been discussed for thousands of years do we have free will or no very important question if we have free will that means we can make a decision by our will in nobody knows not even god all religions will collapse because they all give power to god to know everything if we don't have free will a bigger question is then why are we being punished for actions predetermined by somebody else the law of karma will break down so that is why it's an important issue do we have free will or no in spirituality the answer is different from the answer in psychology and the answer in psychology is different from the answer in physics and today i read the article on the answer in physics which i hadn't read earlier the spiritual answer is simple the spiritual answer says that we have an experience of free will in the human body a genuine real experience of free will we have a genuine experience of free will in a state just above the mind which sometimes we call parabrahm a state where the spirit recognizes it is a soul and a spirit and not the body or the mind we have a genuine experience of free will at that stage and finally at the top there is only totality of consciousness we have real free will not merely an experience the real free will exists there so three points real free will at the top an experience of free will just above the mind when the spirit recognizes itself and an experience of free will in the human body three places since we are not aware of the other two places in normal physical life so we put these questions do we have free will if you are part of that total you have if you are not you don't have it the truth is we are all part of the total we are all coming from there therefore we have real free will but not here we have real free real free will somewhere else within ourselves not outside within ourselves but not in our current awareness of a physical world and a physical body therefore in the spiritual path we are told you want to discover your true free will then go within yourself and go to the point where you discover you are not the body you are not the sense perceptions you are not even the mind but your consciousness an individual unit of consciousness where you have exercised free will and you felt it was real just like you feel it's real here you can go higher to totality of consciousness and discover that was real free will there everything was real there free will the only place where everything is real is totality the rest follows from what has been willed there that ultimate will is deciding everything including the experience of free will in parabrahm or even the physical body so if you want to take from the point of view of the top from totality of consciousness 
the one source from where everything has emerged, not emerged, it's still there, but the experience of it has emerged outside, then free will is real. Whose free will is that? Our free will. Can we say my free will or our free will? Here we say my free will because we are separated. This separation is illusion. There's no real separation. It's a separation created for an experience. Therefore, when we find our true reality, our true self, free will is real. Below that, it's an experience. And why does the experience look so real? Very good reason. Let's say, why does the free will in human bodies, in human form, look real? Because we have no idea of the future, even a few minutes ahead of our future, we have no real idea. An accident can happen, which we never predicted. It's unpredictable. Therefore, since the future is totally unpredictable because of our ignorance, free will become real. Supposing we had knowledge, what's going to happen next minute, next hour, next day, next year, next century, free will disappears. That is why in the next two states of consciousness, higher awareness, where we can see the future, free will disappears. It looks like we are going on a pre-programmed life, completely pre-programmed, predetermined, and there is no choice really. The choice making is part of the programming and it's introduced by creating ignorance of the future. Ignorance of the future is making of free will look real. It's an interesting thing that the ignorance should create it, not knowledge. And yet, the way we exercise it, it appears the options are open to us. And whether we like it or not, we have to exercise free will. Now, when we exercise free will, we do with our brain, with our mind, with our thinking process. We think, should I do this or do that? Should I follow this or not follow this? Should I go east or west? Should I go here or there? This deliberation takes place in the mind. And this deliberation, we think, is happening now. This deliberation is pre-programmed. And we can't see the pre-programming. Therefore, it looks real that we are doing things real. Where do we discover it is pre-programmed? In the causal plane within ourselves. If we can rise to the level where we see the mind in its entirety at the causal plane, we discover where it was completely predetermined. And so there's no free will there. There's no free will in the astral plane, no free will in the causal plane, and the appearance of free will here, because the programming that has generated even the manner in which we select things, the manner in which we make choices, he created programmed there. If we can rise above that to a spiritual level, that we will discover we are consciousness, a soul, that makes a decision to pick up a destiny for experimentation, for adventure, for entertainment, for whatever reason, consciousness picks up a destiny to have astral, causal, and physical experiences. We make a choice. We have a real experience of free will. A real experience of free will. When we discover that, then we find out that even here, the free will which we are experiencing, which is not real, was actually picked up by us at that spiritual plane. So we, we become liable for all the law of karma and law of karma become real. That we picked it up, that this is how it operates, therefore we are responsible for it. We are not being punished for something somebody else has done. We did it in this spiritual plane. But it's just an experience. According to this, we can change our destiny. We can go to spiritual level, pick up a different destiny, pick up a different DVD. That means it looks like the free will at the spiritual level of a soul is real. When we go to totality, we find 
even the selection that we make as a soul predetermined there. We picked up the real thing only there. Real free will is only there. The other two levels are merely an experience of free will, but not real. In totality of consciousness, you discover. Very few people in this big planet, billions of people here, very few, maybe you can count them on the fingers of your hands, have attained that awareness. But there, there are seekers, still seekers, who want to attain that state. When those seekers want to attain that state, a perfect living master definitely appears in their life. This is the truth from the spiritual point of view. Let's see what is the psychological point of view. What does the psychologist say? He says what I said yesterday. That the fundamental <coughs> factors that come into play in making a decision lie in our subconscious. We call it subconscious, unconscious, because we are not aware of it. Otherwise, we would call it conscious. The subconscious is something which is part of our own brain, our own memory, but we are not aware of it right now. The subconscious contains everything that ever happened in our life. From childhood till today, if you add a little bit of to the psychology, you add a little bit of physiology and sciences of the body and add some anatomy, then you can go even further and they say what is in the subconscious is also part of our DNA molecule. DNA molecules are subject to great study now. They found out that all our actions are pre-recorded in a DNA molecule and the DNA molecule is not confined to human self but goes back into the whole evolution of consciousness. Right up to plants. Do you know a banana, a fruit that we eat, has 50% same DNA as human beings? 50%, half of the banana is like human. Do you know a monkey is 99% the same DNA as a human being? When you see what a little change in DNA has caused such a big change in awareness, then you realize they say even the subconscious memory picks up not only from the current life from childhood till now, but picks up from the time when we were merely a speck of plasma or something. They go back that far. Whenever the DNA molecule first came, we don't know where it came from. There's one theorist, he says, the first DNA molecule came from Mars. Only male, he says, only male D DNA came. The sperm came from there. The ova was produced on this planet Earth. They say men from Mars, women from Venus, okay, or from the Earth. And what is the basis of that? Basis is very interesting. And that is a very interesting study. Most people don't know about it. That when we examine the mineral content of our body. The mineral content of a woman's body is very similar in proportions to the mineral content of the soil in which we are born and live. It looks like we are made up of something from the earth and the products of the earth are coming up to make up. The mineral content of a male body is different and does not correspond to the things that are around in the soil. This was a real discovery that made people feel the original DMA molecule which created life on this planet must have come from somewhere else because the male species in all forms of life came from there. There are some forms of life where the male and female are both together. And there are some very simple forms of life. They are completely one. And the male carried something with it. But most of the growth in evolution, they say, took place because of a contributing factor from the current planet and from somewhere else we don't know where. Interesting theories, interesting theories. 
and the psych psychology psychological explanation for free will is that all the data stored, whether from from an insect, from an animal, through evolution in the DNA molecule, or whether stored in the subconscious mind from our experiences in physical body after birth. It doesn't matter from which it came. When we make a decision, that data is fixed already. You can't change it. Therefore, if the decision making is based on that data, we'll always make a predictable decision. And why we call it free will is because we are unaware of that data. That's the explanation. The similar to the explanation I gave yesterday that if, if we make a decision, what are the factors that allow us to think about what to choose? After all, we think and we decide always by thinking, should I do this or do that? What are the factors that make you think this or that? Those factors are all in our mind and they are all based upon genetics and environment. It's just another way of explaining the psychology of free will. And therefore, it's an experience, real experience of free will, but there's no real free will because the factors that make us decide are already fixed. Now, what does this professor of physics say, which I read this morning? The professor of physics is examining the molecules and atoms. And he is examining that our entire self, which is a body, a thinking self, but it's a body made up of a brain that can think. Every part of this body, without exception, is made up of molecules and atoms. Every part of the body is nothing more than molecules and atoms. And molecules and atoms are completely acting according to laws of physics and nobody can change them. Therefore, he says, what we call free will is a function that is taking place according to laws of physics on the molecules and atoms and there's no way we can change it. Therefore, we have no re real free will. But because we are unaware of the function of these atoms and molecules, therefore we think we have free will. Again, it's an absence of knowledge of something. In the first case, absence of knowledge that we come from one. In second case, in psychology, absence of knowledge what is stored in our brains, in our subconscious. In third, absence of knowledge, we don't know how the molecules and atoms in us are operating. In each three cases, we feel we have free will, we experience free will, but we don't have a real free will. When this professor was very happy, he found the predictability of our actions, which we call free will. That they are predictable if you have full knowledge. At the end, he gets a little confused in his article. His confusion arises from the fact that there is a right-handed man. He writes with the right hand. Why he's right-handed? What has made him right-handed? His constitution, his molecules and atoms have made him right-handed. Now, when he writes with the right hand, it's automatic for him, and he's following the laws of physics. Supposing he discovers that I am right-handed because it's natural for me, I'm built like that, and says, no, let me beat this rule, and write with my left hand. He will write very clumsy. But if he can write even clumsy, that means he had defied the laws of physics. And he says, how is that possible? And people are doing it. They are defying the laws of physics. There gets confusion. Then he leaves the subject that this can never be answered. We can't have find a final answer. But he tries to answer a physics answer and finds the contradiction himself. Interesting article. And I thought that I should share this with you, that we have been examining this issue of free will for a long, long time. And people ask me, do we have real free will or is all predetermined? If I say it's all predetermined, why are we being punished for something we didn't do It was predetermined? Simple questions like that. Well, we are pre uh, punished because we picked up the punishment at another level. We are following that because we picked up another level. Where are those levels? The levels are inside you. Go and see. But we haven't seen the levels. 
But you can't blame anybody else. If you haven't seen the levels, you go and see them. So therefore, the spiritual answer ultimately comes up. Go and find the truth about your own self. Find out who you really are. Are you consciousness? Are you the power to experience anything that you can be conscious of? Is consciousness a power? Or is it merely a recept receptive agency that can receive and become conscious of things? How can we answer that question without ultimately examining consciousness at its roots? And the consciousness at its roots, it does not lie on things, ideas, language that is being used by consciousness. It comes where consciousness exists and is operating. That means you discover your own true self. If you discover your true self, what do you find? It's in stages, you find in stages. I've never seen anybody jump to the state and I said, I found out my consciousness. Never seen anybody. Because the person who says that, I found out my consciousness is making an untruth statement. He's still separating I and the consciousness. The obvious mistake. He's still using his mind which says I have found something which is myself. There's a contradiction right there. You cannot say that if you found consciousness. If you found consciousness, you can answer all questions. But you cannot say you found consciousness because you are consciousness. So that is why the ability to find your true original state, which I call totality of consciousness. I could call it ultimate God, creator, anything. But when I use those words, ultimate God, creator, it looks like I'm separating myself from that, which is totally untrue. If somebody believes that you are sitting here separate from God, that's totally a negation of the definition of God. God includes everything. There is nothing outside of God. When you say God is omnipresent, it doesn't mean that he spread himself out. It means whatever is present is in him or her. We don't even are not sure of the sex, sex of God. And some people object to God being declared as a young male being. Why not a goddess? Why is the origin not called goddess? Should be called goddess. God, goddess. Somebody neutral is even worse. So anyway, what is the nature of God? We can discover within ourselves by going to our own origin. If you can find yourself as, a, as consciousness per se, you can also find where the consciousness originates from. As I mentioned yesterday, the pathway to discovering yourself, very simple. So long as you have a mind and you feel your free will. Doesn't matter real or unreal, so long as you are experiencing free will and so long you have a mind to think about it. Think, do I really want to know who I am? Yes, I want to know who I am. It's a thought. Where will I find it? <coughs> I'll find myself where I am thinking myself is. It's not outside of my body anyway. It's inside myself. Narrow it down. I am thinking from my head, not from anywhere else. All right? Then you withdraw yourself into your head, examine what's happening inside my head. Besides looking at the head from outside, where I see the gray matter and the brain and all that and some little organs, can I see it from inside? How will it look like if we saw it from inside? Or did let me go back into the center of the head and see, can I see something working inside the head? Am I, when I close my eyes, am I in the center? No. You can't close your eyes and be in the center of the head. You are at the eyes. You're trying to look out. Now you're not looking out. Closing eyes does not take you to the center at all. Closing eyes only means your attention is outside. You can't see outside because you close your eyes. It's not going inside your head at all. But if you are able to close your eyes and say, I am now in front of the eyes, I can feel it. What would happen if I step back, step back further? 
when you try to do that to step back further you find suddenly you are a living entity in your head otherwise how are you moving back how can you move backwards in a body that is still eyes that are closed and you are able to move backwards and forwards who is that who do you feel that is your own self you never feel somebody else is moving you are moving okay when you can move inside and backwards and forwards sideways if you can move inside the physical head in any direction you like and you want to go to the center and see does something different happen if you try to be in the center if you try this simple experiment you will find amazing things happen just by going to the center amazing things are you see lights colors things in the bible it says if thy eye be single thy whole body shall be filled with light what's the meaning of single eye if the eye be single it doesn't mean this eye obviously it means if you can find the eye the single eye from which you operate as living beings and through which you see through eyes two eyes if you can put your attention which is exactly in the center of the head if you put your attention there you can see a light greater than any light you have seen outside sometimes people get shocked when they do that therefore it is simply a matter of going to the center from where we are operating as wakeful human beings now if we are a unit just a point of life a point of consciousness sitting in a body and make the whole body alive from that point because of our power of life is exactly that point in the center of the head therefore the most important thing to discover yourself the very fundamental thing is to go to that point before you do anything else we don't do it even those who are seeking the truth and meditating for years and years are not doing the most fundamental thing to go to the center to start with and you can't find anything if you're not at that place because the moment you move away from it you are moving away from where you are not you moving away from the real core the core does not move when you say i am ahead what makes you say i am ahead you are saying it from the same center but you have put your attention somewhere else the attention has moved away and therefore you feel you are moved away you are not operating the attention from fr- forward place from the same core withdrawal of attention to your own self from the very point from where it's originating in the human body in wakeful physical state is the is the most important gateway to opening any other experience if you have experiences that takes place without doing that they can be generated by suggestion they can be generated by hypnosis they can be gen- generated by putting attention on eye center which is the center of great energy there are six centers of energy in our body the energetic circuitry that is formed by these six centers is not only sustaining the body it's also sustaining our activities it's sustaining our ability to use energy for anything walking talking doing anything creating everything we are doing is from the centers of energy and they start from the bottom from the rectum the genitals the navel the heart and the throat eyes the sixth center is behind the eyes therefore when we talk of the six centers of energy they include the center in the eyes that is very confusing the six centers of energy are in the eyes six centers of awareness also start from the eyes and go backwards in the head and not go downward in the physical body that is why this confusion people go into a meditation of six chakras six centers 
and they go from center to center using different kind of mantras for each center, generating an energy of its own at each center, and move upwards one by one and find great solace in the heart center. The other centers have different kind of energies. The genetic center, genitals where the genitals are, that is a pleasure and sometimes called that is center of pleasure. The actual words are used like that. So therefore, it's, it's designed to pull your attention there and hold it there, which is very important uh, in our human life. But the heart center, which is the center of emotions, and emotions play such a big role in our life. Therefore, the heart center, some people start believing we are really coming from the heart center in our wakeful state. Of course, we are not. The heart center, heart palpitates with emotion. Heart becomes active with emotions. When you have knowledge, you are not emotional, you are cool. When you are not cool, you are at the heart center. When you are cool, you are in the head. Therefore, awareness is center of coolness behind the eyes and the center that takes us up to our knowing we are there is in the sixth center of energy. The sixth center of energy in the eyes tells us we exist. Great! That's the discovery we make through the meditational experiences through the six centers. I spent a lot of time in this trying to understand what are we getting from there. We are getting a knowledge that I exist. Why? Because I went through all the energy centers and discovered my energetic self, that I exist in the eyes. But that's the sixth center. I didn't know that the eyes open both ways, not physical eyes. Another pair of eyes are opening, and those are the eyes which we see with imagination. When we imagine things, we are still seeing things, but not employing the physical eyes at all. And what, where are those eyes coming from? They are also behind these eyes. When you imagine something, are you imagining from your hands? No. Where are you imagining from? From the same eyes, but not these eyes. So that is why the location of the eyes that imagine is the same as the eyes that see outside. Very confusing. So we begin to rely even on the eyes that are looking outside for looking inside and I was very surprised to see some people thinking that to see inside you have to roll these eyes backward. <laughs> well, terrible, I see the state looking up, so the rolling is easy. And looking up with the eyes rolled, they can't roll, they're not meant for that, they're not built like that. And they think we have to roll a physical eyes back to see in, inside. These eyes have nothing to do with seeing inside. But the eyes of imagination are automatically operating inside. And when we locate ourselves, right in the center. And how do we locate ourselves? I'll give you a simple, very simple trick to do it. Don't try to find the center at all. When you try to find the center, you move away from the center. Because that's our nature. Our nature is to find something, it will always be away from us, no matter what. You want to find something, we are the finder, and the object is to find what is to be found. The finder does not ever become the object of finding. So when we say, let me find, you're already wrong. Never try to find the third eye center. Realize you are at the third eye center. How do you realize you are at the third eye center? Imagine you are there. That's simple. When I got initiated from this master, I went back to him after a few months and I said, I have a very big problem of finding my third eye center. He said, why? He said, it should be easy. Can't you imagine yourself? I, I can't imagine myself. He said, not uh, imagine yourself separate from yourself. No, imagine yourself. I said, how do I imagine myself? If I want to say I'm imagining myself there, I'm still here also. It's just an imagination there. He said, oh, can't you put yourself that you moved there and a the body left behind? I 
He said, with deep imagination, I can do that. He said, all right. Raise your hand and put up your index finger up, so which I did. He said, imagine you have lifted yourself above the finger. With little effort, I said, I am no longer. I'm just rising like I'm sitting on the finger. He said, are you still up there? Yes. Bring it down slowly. Are you still up there? I'm still up there. Bring it up here. Are you still up there? Still up there. Jump in. And I jumped in. I was at third. I said. <laughs> the secret is to use imagination to jump in where, where you are. Already. Supposing I were to make an imagination, I am standing here. And I would jump back to where I am. I jump. I'll be exactly where I was to start with. The same thing happens inside, in imagination. So when we imagine we are where we are, not imagine some other place, no third eye center. Imagine where you are, you are at third eye center. But you are scattered. You don't imagine yourself to be a single point. You don't imagine yourself to be small. You imagine you are big. If I imagine this body of mine is there, it's too small a place to fit the body. So I try to do two things. Either I try to make a small picture of myself to place there so it fits in the head, and that is not me, but I'm making a picture. Get go wrong straight away. When I try to make a picture of myself to sit behind the eyes, I go wrong to sit in the beginning. Now I try to fit myself, the whole of myself as I am, in the space. Second option, much better, I expand the space. By imagination, you can do that. I imagine first it's a huge place where I'm in, in the bottom. Then I forget my boundaries. I forget that there's a boundary of my head. I'm imagining. I'm imagining a big garden. I imagine I'm in a big garden and the flowers all around me. I'm the center. So the whole body fits in there. Big difference in the two. Do not contract yourself to fit in the head. You will always remain in physical consciousness. But if you imagine the space expanding here and you fitting in as you are, then you are at the third eye center. Such is important point for the beginning of good effective meditation. And we go wrong right on that. And people do not realize it even after years and years of meditation that the very first step was not correct. So therefore, I'm sharing this with you that if you are meditating, correctly, effectively, to find your inner self. Then first, imagine you have moved from where you are physically. Through imagination, your imaginative self, just like the physical self, has moved into a big space here. That is why I suggest some other additional points to imagine. And one good one is that this body of yours is a house you live in. It has six floors. When you begin to look at your body, it's my house, I'm living in sixth floor. The concept of a bigger house outside automatically comes in. It's a house, you can't think houses were small rooms. You can't think like that. When you say it's a house in which I live and there are several floors of the house, you are expanding your space already by that simple imagination. When you imagine you are in a house, and there are many floors. I can see my elevator at the back. A nice elevator along the spine. By the way, the energetic centers also operate like this. There are, there are, there's a spinal elevator. And you can go down on the spinal elevator as quickly as you like to any center. And there are stops at every center. And you can move very slowly through stairs, staircase. Then go slowly from one center to the other in front. So you can feel in energetic experiences that there's a front of the house with staircase and there's an elevator at the back of the spine. Now, if you can imagine this structure of your house, then you know you are in a house with the sixth floor and then you want to lay a carpet there. What size carpet? Oh, it's a huge room. It's not this small. It's quite a you, you never get a carpet into this area. And you are laying a carpet in that house and putting drapes on the wall. You already enlarge that space. 
for the whole of you as you know yourself fitting in there. Don't forget the astral self is of the same size, same form as this form. <coughs> it is not a small, small little thing. Same form, the different perceptions, sense perceptions in the astral body are located exactly as they are located in the physical body. When you move your hands, the hands are as far away from your head as in this body. So therefore, when you create the space by thinking it's a house, it's an easier way to do it. These are tips I can share briefly with you. Of course, I can share more extensively if we were having regular meditation sessions with you. But the tips are useful because this is an error people make for years and years without moving forward in meditation. And that's why I'm sharing with you. That this is very important that you use imagination, a great asset. Imagination is as important, if not more important, than attention. And attention is needed to concentrate it wherever you want to be. So that is why these three things have to be used together. Imagination, putting attention through imagination, and concentrating it there where you believe you are. Then, look at the room you are in, the garden you are in, not the body. The body has disappeared already in your imagination. But you will still feel you have the body, naturally, because the attention, our attention is so well scattered today, is scattered fully in the body from the third eye center. And that is why we are aware of a body. It's the scattering of attention that creates awareness of a body. And from the body, we are scattering it to other bodies, to space around us, to a world around us, and the whole universe around us is all by scattering of attention from third eye center. In a way, we are creating the universe around us from the third eye center, but we don't know it. We think we are just experiencing it from here. One day you can find out how the origin of the experiences comes from. Even scientists will begin to feel that. In the next 20 years you will see. Because they won't find answers to the questions that they have been raising today and raising it for years and years. Einsteinian theory will be dismissed. All new theories of space and time will be dismissed when you discover that the subjective time and space are holding sway over everything else. Beginning has already been made by this guy who just died last week. And he said, I can realize before the Big Bang there was time which called imaginary time. The very imaginary time we are imagining now. Next step will be, if there is nobody to imagine, will it still be there? That question will automatically come. It hasn't come yet. It hasn't come in physics yet. It will come. It has to. Einstein said he did not give importance to the role of the observer, and he died after that. This man said, imagination is the reality before this reality came into being. Very big statement. But he died before he can explore it further. Somebody will pick it up. And you will see more. But in spiritual practice, you can get answer to these questions ahead of all these people. What I am sharing with you today, I was sharing 60 years ago. It's not something new. I was sharing the same things. In fact, today morning I was saying, should I give any more talks or not? Because I repeat the same things I've been repeating for 60 years. Why should I give more talks? People can now listen to all my talks. They are recorded and played out on YouTube. And they can just hear me repeating things. I did realize, when you get old, in India they say when you get old, old the definition is 70, 72. They say a mind cannot function properly after 70, 72. And therefore, the person who is old begins to repeat the stories he has told earlier. It's a sign of old age. And he does not know he's repeating the stories. So the people are listening and saying, yes, yes. And they heard it many times before. Out of courtesy, they don't tell him. OK, Grandpa, very nice story. But the stories are being repeated. I must be lucky that I can remember the stories I'm repeating. <laughs> and I keep on repeating them. This morning, I was just saying, why am I repeating the stories? 
I should just lead people to meditate and find things and not tell all the stories all over again. But then I found that I can add a few new words, like I added the words, I read an article today. That was new. <laughs> I could never repeat it earlier. So I should only read articles <laughs> and begin my talks by referring to the articles and end with what I just say every day. The truth is that it's very interesting to hear all this. People who are actually seeking the truth, it hits them, it resonates with them. This is, this is what I feel is inside. I knew this is it. But very often we leave it at that point. We don't follow up. We don't practice. And when we start practicing, we forget all we heard and we say, close eyes, we are tired tomorrow. Maybe weekend. Maybe after I retire. So we postpone. And therefore, the talks merely remain talks. And they don't become practice. But if we are really serious, I sometimes say, repetition is good if it can make you start. If I keep on repeating the same thing every day, and you haven't started 10 times on repetition, 11th will make you start. <laughs> so repetition is good that way. It's sort of a reminder. I sometimes feel all these meetings we have are merely triggers to make us remember the importance of something, the most important thing. You cannot get this opportunity in any other form of life. Not even as angels. Not even as gods or goddesses that people believe in, live in some heavens. Not even that. They all have knowledge and don't have the opportunity of seeking. We are very, very fortunate to have human bodies and can seek the greatest gift to us that we have the power to seek. And when you seek, you find. Somebody asked me once, why are you so sure of it? The way you say, if you seek, you will find. I said, first of all, it's not, I am not, it's not an original statement. I find the same statement even in spiritual, religious literature. Seek and you will find. It's not something new. The second thing is, some good people did an experiment and they wrote a book called The Secret. I don't know if any one of you read that book called The Secret. It became so popular, a million copies were sold. Then they made a movie on the same book, The Secret. What does the book say? The book says, if you seek something earnestly and believe it is there, you will get it, no matter what. He says, destiny itself plays out like that. So, and they said it worked. They sought to make a million dollars. They came up with the idea and they made a million dollars. At least it worked for them. It doesn't work for anybody else. How come people by the millions read the book and they are exactly where they were, they all want to be millionaires and none of them became millionaires? <laughs> what, what was missing? What was missing was a requirement in that seeking which says, you must believe that you have already found it, what you're seeking. The mind does not let us do that. The mind creates doubt. Maybe it will. The moment the maybe comes, seeking fails. And you can't find. The seeking that we are making inside, which does not come from the mind, always succeeds. Seeking that comes from the mind and has doubt accompanying it, never succeeds. That's a simple truth. But the way they describe that if you believe and can clearly see what you believe, you will get it. I attended a seminar long time back. It was called EST, E-S-T, EST, because it was set up by a man whose name started like that, Erhard, and it was Erhard Seminar Training, E-S-T. But he used the word est in French A, which means is. And basic teaching was what is, is. 
What ought to be is only your mind, mental game. So don't go after what ought to be, go after what is. Live in is, not live in ought to be. And that is why your life will become productive. But when it defines what is, it says that supposing you have a concept in your head, you want to be so and so, you want to have such a position, and you make it is now, it will become is even in the future. And they propounded it as a law of attraction, that whatever we think in our head, we attract the same thing. They also said, if you are thinking, I want to be big, but no, there's no chance, you are already attracting no chance. Therefore, you will never get it. The basic idea that they produce in their book is that if you can visualize, actually visualize the future and see it clearly, you can work backward and see it will bring you where you are now and you will reach that future. That happened many years ago and they gave an exercise book, a notebook for us to make notes. They said, write on this 10 things you want to achieve and visualize that you've already achieved them. And when we did this, in a review I found most people actually achieved what they wrote because they visualized it. So visualization and accepting the visualization is not only good for now, it's good for the time for which you're visualizing, achieve visualization. So this is something we have tried on different platforms, even the psychological platform, even then question comes up, and people asking me this question. If we are able to use the prescription given in the book called The Secret, and by visualizing we get something that's not in our destiny, are we changing our destiny? If we are, then there is no predetermination. By using simple trick given in a book, we can change our destiny and achieve something that's not in our destiny then it's not predetermined. My answer was very simple. You should, not, you should go and read your destiny, what it says. Destiny will say, you will go and read the book and apply the secret, it will change. That's part of your destiny. <laughs> you have not changed destiny. You lived into the destiny. Whatever is happening here is strictly according to the predetermined destiny. But just because what is happening here appears to be making changes because of our own will, or changes because of what we are thinking of deliberating, we think we are changing something. The changes are all predetermined. The manner in which you think and operate is all predetermined. And to verify this, to validate this particular statement, there is no way to do it except by going to the causal plane and discovering how destinies are made, how you are picked up. And this is a great, wonderful experience to be able to see how not only your destiny, all destinies, Huge combination and permutation of, com of destinies are there. One thing that bothered me when I was young was when we die, people say you reincarnate and have another life. And that other life is based upon your karma of this life. And karma means your interactions with people here. You hurt some people, you please some people, and the people you hurt in the next life, they hurt you. The one you please here, they please you. Something like that works out. In my one life, I can be thousands of people. How does the karma, law of karma operate? Will it bring all those thousand people again in my next life? I met people in different parts of the world. Will they all assemble in one place or will I again be spread out all over? How can you create a particular life pattern when all those people that you created karma with are all spread out? The places where you created karma, the associations which are there are all different from what you will have in the future. How do you play it out? In some religions, especially Hinduism, they say when you die, there is a real a god sitting there called Dharmraj. He is a god of angel of death. And he, when you die, he shows you your life backwards. This is what you did. Now I'm going to put you back into a life based on what you can see here. 
and he creates a new life for you there. Very strict guy, very relentless. Some other people say there's an angel of death. Some people say angels of death take us from here and put us into a new life. Whoever does it, what kind of computer does he use? What kind of mechanism is available to him to make thousands of associations we have reappear as a new life with the same people? How is it possible? The permutation combination, when we buy a lottery ticket with five, six numbers on it, it has millions of combinations. And this thousands of associations would have unimaginable number of combinations. How does he succeed in putting it down? I could not find an answer till I found the most astonishing answer. Most astonishing. The answer was, we don't have to bring those people again at all. We bring those people as an experience of your next life. And the people you are seeing now, you think they are real having interactions. They are an experience of people. And the experience of people can be changed to any number of people. It's just an experience of consciousness that is creating it. That was a very astonishing answer because it made the whole world look so different than what one imagines. But that is exactly how it happened. That's a lot of awareness to be able to find out that we create our entire experience of life, no matter what. But we don't create it from physical self. We create it from somewhere else where we are also being created. Physical body is being created. Our mind is being created from the same source where everything else is created. And when you have that knowledge, you discover how the system of reincarnation really operates. It's very different from what I was imagining. It is a creative power that creates a new scene and the characters are fitted in according to your previous karma. So it's, it's a old question. Does the world come in first and then you see it or you are creating your own world? Of course, a simple answer can be found. Do you have any means of finding this world or any world without your sense perceptions? If you have, then it's a matter of discovering the world is there or not. If the only way you are aware of this physical universe is from your physical sense perceptions, and sense perceptions are working within yourself, is it not possible that the sense perceptions are creating the whole universe? It is possible. Is there any way to test it out? Well, to test it out, we have to see where sense perceptions come from. Are they coming from outside? Or are they coming from inside? When we begin to investigate the source of our sense perceptions, we find they are coming from the mind. When can we find that? For sure. We can find for sure only before they are created. And when we see the way they are created, that only happens when our awareness is at the causal level of the mind alone, without sense perceptions. Then you discover how they come. When we have a dream here, can you find in a dream that we are dreaming? No. You can even tell people, I am dreaming. And you think they are real people to whom you are telling. When you wake up, there are no people to tell. That is why in a single state of awareness, we cannot find the source or origin of it. When we wake up, we know it was a dream. We created it with our mind. Similarly, you can find that the mind creates sense perceptions. And the sense perceptions are then picking up the whole universe, it's all a reverse order than we imagine. The origin of all experiences is inside us, not outside. There's nothing existing outside except inside. The whole universe that you see outside is all a projection from inside. That's very big, very big awareness to get to that personal awareness. Theoretically, we can hear it and talk about it, but to have a personal experience like that requires deep meditation. Go to the causal level, and you'll see that for yourself. So there's a proof one can get for oneself. Then if I, if I am awake, I know dream is unreal. Then after knowing dream is unreal, can I take a dream seriously? When next night I sleep again, I take it real again. 
In fact, we like sometimes dream so much, we like dream more than wakeful state. I remember one such incident. I won a dream, $5 million in a lottery. He asked me, you want a check or cash? I said, cash. <laughs> and the man brought all those big bundles of currency notes, <coughs> was counting and placing, and I woke up. I tried hard to go to sleep again. <laughs> At least let me collect the money, then I can wake up. How did this happen? It is just a matter of what experience you are having. The same thing is true of this physical experience. It's also dreamlike. Same thing is true of every experience. It's created the same way from consciousness. So that is why it's a, it's a very big game that we are playing. Sometimes we say, <coughs> sometimes we say, like Shakespeare said, this whole world is just a stage on which we are mere actors. <coughs> Let's say, is it true? The whole world is just a stage, we are mere actors. Why did Shakespeare say that? Because there were no movies. Now we have movies. We can see the drama on movies also. So we can say this world is just a movie and we are mere actors in that movie. When we go to see a movie in a theater, theater hall, we are sitting away from the screen. The play is taking place on a screen in front of us. Screen is black, generally white or pale. What is on the screen is just a shadow. Shadow of pictures that are being displayed by a projector which is behind us, not in front of us. Projector is behind us. In that projector, a film has been loaded. There's a light behind the film, and the light sends the image onto the screen, and screen displays what is in that film. Very simple. Now, if we know this, we go to a movie, we'll say this is a, just a picture, movie frame going on, and there's a shadow being cast on this film. What will happen to us? Never enjoy the movie. There's just pictures thrown on the screen. There's nothing real. But we don't act like that. Horrible things are happening, going to happen on the screen, and we sit on the edge on the chair. Something nice cracks up, oh, we laugh like it's real. We forget the projector. We forget the film. We forget the light. We forget everything. We make that screen a real playground. The real is happening, really. Why do we do it? Why do we forget? It's just a flat screen with shadows on it. We are thinking people are running there, people are going there. When will you go there now? Our mind is constantly accepting it as real. This question was answered long ago by a Greek philosopher, Aristotle. Aristotle said that when we see drama, because there were no movies, when we see drama, we deliberately forget that it's unreal. We make it real, and he said this is actually that we are actually suppressing our disbelief. We would normally not believe, it's real. We are actually suppressing our disbelief so that we can make it look real. And why? Because that's the only way we can identify with it and get the excess of our emotions turned our way. He called it purgation of emotions. He says it's a deliberate effort that the mind makes not to take it as unreal. So we begin to automatically to make identification with what is happening there. We deliberately suppress our disbelief and say we believe it. The answer is holding true even today. That when we watch movies, what interests us in the movie 
they try to make it as lifelike as possible. And we are affected by it. We have tears in our eyes. We cry like it's something real happening. Now imagine there's a movie we want to be more associated with than merely suppressing our disbelief. What could we do? Could we then, while the movie is going on, make it three-dimensional by putting glasses on and enter into one of the character's head? Supposing we go and sit in one of the characters so we can see the movie very closely, we'll become that actor. If we forget we are sitting in the character in order to enjoy the movie, we will be that actor. Can you imagine? This is exactly what is happening here. This is a movie. All we have done is, through our consciousness, place ourselves in the head of one character. And the name given to that character has become our name. And what is happening to that character day and night is happening to us now. We've forgotten. We're watching something. Well, the play is very high, ups and downs, with some tragic events happening in it, some good things. They look good if you watch a movie. We pay a ticket to go and watch a movie, horror movies. But in this movie, since we are sitting in a character, we are horrified what is happening to us. And we say it's a terrible state to be in this movie. Can we still watch the movie and not be horrified? Yes, we can. How? Discover the reality that you are merely watching from not where the body is, where you are watching it from. And where is that place where you're watching it from? Third eye center. Supposing from tomorrow you decide to look on this world, it's a movie, we are all characters, prescribed, every mind is speaking out the words, it is already pre uh, predetermined and we are watching it sitting on a comfortable chair behind looking at life. The horrified nature of the movie disappears. You enjoy the movie like you enjoy a movie on the screen. It is a movie, but you can't discover it till you find out how it was made. If we want to sit in a movie hall and say, oh, it's not real, how will we say it's not real? This is merely a projection from a projector behind me. And projector has a film already shot. It's not happening now. Nothing is happening now. It's all preloaded. We don't know when the film was shot, where it was shot, in how many shots it was put in together. But it's not, it is not happening now. It happened somewhere and we are watching something pre-recorded. And then we go further and forget the hall and say, let's go see what happened in the projector. You go to the projector, that the film has no value unless the light falls through it. When light falls through it, we can see it on the screen. We discover the whole secret. This movie we are watching called Life can be discovered the same way. Consciousness is the light. Life or consciousness is the light. The mind is the rolled up movie, creating time, space and events. And when the light of consciousness falls through this movie, and fall on the screen of a three-dimensional screen of space-time outside, we are watching the movie. If you can find that out, it's at will whether you want to see a particular scene or not, whether you want to feel different about it or not, because it's a movie you are watching, and the control of watching the movie falls back to you at third eye center. It's a very big development. But then also, by doing this exercise and discovering the light, and discovering where the film is, which means discovering the mind, and discovering how the creation is taking place outside. You have answers to all your questions about yourself and the creation. At that time you find the creation is a product of the self and not the other way around. And the self, the true self, is totality. Nothing exists outside of it. We have not left our true home at all. We are there, the whole experience of separating, leaving, is taking place within our true home, not outside. 
That is why when people say, I want to make a spiritual journey. I say, journey implies you have to go somewhere. How far do you think you have to go? He said, I have no idea. Maybe it's a million trillions of miles away where my true home is. No idea where it is. I said, supposing I tell you it's a very short distance. He said, how short? I said, supposing I say it's inside. Will it be a few inches? I said, no. A few centimeters? No. What's the distance between your true home and where you are today? Zero centimeters. You are there. The spiritual journey does not mean going anywhere. It's not even a journey. It's a realization of who you are. It's a realization of your true self, which is covered by other things. You remove the awareness of covers. You discover your true self exactly where you are. Somebody sent me a very nice song sent in, in Indian language. It said, it nahi te kith nahi, which meant, if it is not here, it is nowhere. The truth is, the ultimate truth lies in here and now, nowhere else. If it is here and now, it has to be found in here and now. Fortunately for us, all the time we have is now. Nobody ever lives in any other time except now. Now seems to move. That's an illusion. It's an illusion of time. Then now seems to move. Now has no time at all. Does now have a few seconds? No. Even a few seconds means it's past. Before that was future. Now is merely a meeting point of past and future with no time in it at all. Not even a billionth part of a billionth second. Now is completely timeless. And yet we are living in the timeless moment all the time. How does it happen? How does it happen that we are living in a timeless moment called now? It has no time and we are feeling every experience is happening in time. Where is this illusion coming from? It's simple to know that the past and future are separate. What we call past, present and future is merely a division of experiences we say have happened, experiences will happen, and experiences that are happening, we divide like that. And all these three require time. To say experiences are happening requires time. <coughs> Cannot happen in now. Experiences will happen requires time. Experiences have happened requires time. And we are in now with no time. How is it all happening? Very interesting question to understand the nature of time. When we say, there's a book somebody presented to me, Live in the Now. I was very surprised to see the title. I, I want to meet anybody in the world who does not live in the now. They're already living. There's no other time to live in except now. There's no other time except now to be living in. So how is he suggesting live in the now? Then I understood he is referring to the same mistake we all make. We call the past few minutes, past few hours as now. We are calling, I am just speaking to you in the present because I just spoke in few minutes. That was present. The rest is past. We are defining a small part of the past as present. <laughs> it's not really present. It just happened. What not has happened is not present. That's future. What has just happened, present. And the rest, little remote, is past. All right. What about future? Does it really exist? Does a future really exist? Let me put this question to you in a different way. Supposing you did not have the capacity to hope, capacity to fear, capacity to anticipate, would you still have a future? Imagine this. Can anybody ever imagine, contemplate a future without hoping, fearing, and anticipating? And they're all the same thing, by the way. Hoping is positive anticipation. Fear is, fearing is negative anticipation. Anticipation neutral. Can we have 
any concept of a future if these three functions of the mind were not there? No. Future would disappear. Have you ever thought of it? That just by an action of our mind, a thinking process of our mind, we are creating a whole future. Therefore, if we cannot have the function of hoping, fearing, and anticipating in our mind, there will be no future. Then what is future? Future is the function of the mind to hope, fear, anticipate. That function takes time, and every time you do it, it's in the past. In truth, what we call the past is past. What we call present is a recent past. What we call future is a function of mind in the past. The only truth is past. No present, no future. If that is true, how do you go back into the past? Is there any way to go into the past? If something is already moved away, how can you go back? Only one way. Memory. Recall. Now I'm talking something very deep. If you want to go deep into it, you will understand the whole process by which we are creating our whole life is through memory. Everything that we are creating here is through memory. We are reliving, recalling something stored in memory. Memory means something happened, then only we can recall. And now has no time for anything to happen. It must have happened somewhere else, some other time. If you are recalling. It's exactly like a movie being played and shot. The movie was shot somewhere else. Where was this shot? Where was this movie shot which we in a now, timeless now, are able to remember through a created past by memory. Where was it shot? Can we find out? We have no idea at all. Yes, we can. Go to the causal plane within your consciousness. Move movie shot there. And not one movie. Not million, not trillion. A unlimited, infinite number of movies. All possible combination of events are there. Created there manufactured there and we are merely picking up one DVD from there and playing it out and think we call it life. Just one movie we have picked up and we are calling it life here because we have entered the head of one character in that movie. Such a simple thing. All this truth can be discovered that I am sharing with you right inside yourself. Don't have to believe me. Don't have to believe anybody. Just experience it and see is it real? Is it true? And you can find it within yourself. I have shared some things which are extraordinary, like that we are projecting the whole universe. And some are very ordinary, that while we are human beings, we can act in a certain way, we can use our body in a certain way, we can practice meditation in a physical head. If it's illusion, <laughs> what am I suggesting? Go to illusion of a head? I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting go into a real head. There is a real reality created here. Illusions have not been created. A process of illusion in a way was used to create reality. We can discover that also. But we have created reality, have not created illusion. We have made sure the reality passes the test of reality. How did we do that? By dividing our experience of life into different sense perceptions. I want to know, is this table that I am looking at real? I touch it. It's real, I touched it. I am using one experience of a sense perception of vision, sight, another perception of touch. The two corroborate, it's real. I can apply similarly different sense perceptions, put them together and say it's real. If all of them are just a creation of illusion, then we are creating reality out of illusion. There was a follower of Mahatma Gandhi in India and was very spiritual minded. And when Gandhi died, she opened up a school for children to dance. So one of my jobs took me to that place and she invited me to come and preside over a dance session of their students. I went there, I enjoyed the dance and I said it's very good. Then she said, have a cup of tea with me. I want to ask you a very difficult question. I said, I love difficult questions. Let's see how difficult it is. And she said, 
at tea time, they're having a cup of tea. She said, I want to understand a word used in our scriptures, Indian scriptures. It's called Maya. They say this world consists of consciousness and Maya. It's an experiencer and is experiencing Maya. What is the meaning of Maya? I said, what does the book say, translation? What does the dictionary say? Dictionary says illusion. Now, she says, I can't understand. You enjoyed the dance. My performer students are so happy to see you. How can it all be illusion? I said, not illusion, it's all real. Then why are the scriptures saying this world is illusion? I said, the scriptures are not saying that. You're just misunderstanding the word, Maya. I'll explain it to you what Maya means. Now then I try to explain to her, and I'll give you the same explanation I gave to her. I said, here is a cup of tea, and you are drinking, sipping tea. Turned out to be water anyway. <laughs> I said, you are sipping some tea. Are you sipping or not? Is it a real experience or unreal? It's real. I said, let me tell you, it is real. Absolutely real. No illusion whatsoever in that. Your experience of sipping the tea is real. You just had it. How can you deny it? The experience took place. That's the reality. The reality is that you sipped a cup of tea. But what do you say after that, you say, the cup is real. Sorry, that's Maya. That's illusion. And experience is never unreal. We jump from the experience to make the objects of experience real. That misunderstanding is called illusion. Maya means the illusion of des describing real experiences into objects of experience, which are not real, but are being created by that very experience. I gave her an example. Supposing we were both in a sleep state and in a dream. We're sitting in a dream and having an ident identical experience. We're both having a cup of tea. And you will taste a cup of tea, and I'll say, did the taste of cup tea appear real? It was real. And you wake up. Can you still remember the real taste of tea? You can. Was the cup real? No. It was created in the dream. A real experience is generating a belief in us that the objects that created the experience, anything away from the experience, was also real. That's the illusion. Illusion of jumping to that conclusion is unreal, and that's what Maya means. Maya does not mean that the whole thing is unreal. Experiences are always real. We are having genuine, real experiences in consciousness and jumping to the conclusion that the objects that we are experiencing are real because of the experience. Because we have never understood that the experience can be generated in consciousness without any object. And what we are experiencing inside looks like real objects outside. And every day we get evidence of this. Every night we sleep and have dreams. Every night we have real experience of dreams and we wake up the objects were not real, dream was real. That we dreamt was real. That's the nature of our illusion, that we jump to a conclusion. But the way we start understanding illusion is, oh, I did not have any experience at all because of the illusion. That's incorrect. The experience is always real. But jumping to conclusion, what is causing it? And we say, it's causing from something outside, illusion. It's causing from inside, reality. Validate it, go inside. Simple. Well, thank you very much for spending time with me today on this.